Hello, I'm Diego again from Aarhus University, and I'm here to present Leather Lick, our latest attack against ECDSA implementations using less than one bit of non-slippage per signature. The paper was recently accepted in CCS, but a full version is already available on ePrint. This is joint work with Felipe Novaes from University of Campinas in Brazil, Akira Takahashi from Aarhus University, Medi Tibushi from NTT in Japan, and Yuval Yagan from University of Adelaide in Australia. In the talk, I will describe new attacks based on randomness leakage against ECDSA Schnorr type signature schemes. The attacks are based on newly discovered vulnerabilities in ECDSA implementations contained in the OpenSSL and Relic cryptographic libraries, which motivated theoretical improvements to the attack framework of the hidden number problem. In the first part, I will talk about uh, how to acquire such an information from the vulnerable implementations. In the second part, Akira will discuss how to exploit this side channel information to recover the secret key by solving the HNP. Let's start with some background material on attacking ECDSA nonces. So as you know, ECDSA and Schnorr signatures are the most popular schemes relying on the hardness of the discrete log problem. In modern implementations, of course, we will instantiate this assumption using elliptic curve groups. The signing operation involves uh, secret value that's sometimes called the nonce, which is actually a major understatement because this value needs to remain secret uh, for a long term, otherwise it has an impact on the security of the signature scheme. Let's assume a scenario where Alice and Bob want to exchange signatures. So Alice generates uh, a secret key and sends the matching public key to Bob. When she wants to sign a message, she samples a nonce key um, as an integer model of the group order, and then combines the nonce with the message and her private key to obtain a valid signature that Bob can verify using her public key. What's interesting here is, if you look at the set of, of the signing equation, valid signatures look like equations relating uh, public values from the valid signature with two unknowns, the nonce and the private key. This means that if the nonce is exposed somehow, this allows one to immediately compute the private key. So in practice, the nonce can never be reused or exposed. Otherwise, a trivial amount of computation gives the private key. But this is an extreme case. What happens if the nonce is slightly biased? For example, an implementation error or a randomness failure fits the top bits of the nonce. Or maybe a side channel leakage in the implementation uh, reveals some of these top bits. Then the attacker can actually uh, perform a uh, collection of signatures under the same private key and compute the private key at the end by solving the hidden number problem as discussed previously. This class of attacks is not just of academic interest. Actually, they manifest in practice in many different ways. For example, when RNGs are poorly designed or implemented, when a bad entropy source is used to initiate the random number generator, or for example, when a virtual machine resets to a previous snapshot, repeating the internal state. In the context of this talk, um, side channel leakage actually reveals some bits of the nodes that, of course, this is also a danger in practice. The randomness failure became famous uh, with the PlayStation 3 case, where Sony used the same nodes to sign all games, allowing the homebrew community to compute the signing key from just two legitimate games, uh, which had a major impact at the time. So our set of contributions are a novel class of cache attacks against ECDSA implemented in versions 1.0.2 and 1.1.0 of OpenSSL and version 0.4 of the Relic cryptographic library. In principle, the affected curves include any curve in which the group order uh, is just below a power of two among the curves implemented in these libraries. Um, and this is reflected in many of the prime curves standardized by NIST and also the binary and Koblitz curves supported in the same standard and also curves from the SECG, the older SECG standard, such as for example, the Bitcoin curve SECP 256K1. In our first version of uh, the paper, we claim that the attack was effective in OpenSSL against curve P256 but we later found out, thanks to the CCS reviewer who pointed out this, that OpenSSL has custom code for 
this curve that's enabled by default at build time. So it's not vulnerable to the semantax we found in the rest of the code base. And there are other compiler switch, build switches that you can use um, to turn on custom code that's not vulnerable for other curves as well. But these are not enabled by default at build time. It's hard to um, tell exactly what products are affected by this vulnerability because the versions of OpenSSL we target are already deprecated. But by searching GitHub, we actually found out that some packages pumped their OpenSSL versions uh, from 102U to 102V, for example, um, which indicates that they rely on that specific version of the library. These products include the Photon Lightweight Operating System by VMware, uh, the Chef uh, Remote Maintenance Tool, and the Wicker Messaging app. However, it's not clear that the attack will uh, be exploitable in these products in a realistic threat model, just that the uh, implementation is vulnerable in principle, or was vulnerable in principle. So this class of new cache attacks actually motivate improvements in the uh, Fourier analysis attack on the hidden number problem, significantly reducing the number of signatures required to mount the attack. And in a way that it becomes visible, even when less than one bit of nonce leakage is available per signature, which means that the attacker gets one bit of the nonce with less than 100% probability um, by exploiting our case side channel leakage. By combining these two, we implement a full secret key recovery attack against ECDC implemented in OpenSSL over two sets of parameters, a 163-bit binary curve standardized by SECG and a much larger uh, prime curve over 192-bit uh, prime standardized by NIST. The, the former was, uh, the tech was mounted in a laptop with the latter, it was mounted using help of uh, cloud computing. Now let's move to some curve-based cryptography. And you all know that an elliptic curve is a set of solutions, X and Y over uh, some field that satisfy the bias stress equation, where the coefficients of the curve are also taken from the field. And there are some conditions for the curve to be cryptographically interesting. The point at infinity um, serves as the identity element for uh, the group law defined over these points. When the field has a large prime characteristic, the curve can actually be simplified as uh, E1 on the left. And when the curve is defined over a binary field, um, the, the, the equation can be simplified as E2 on the right. The set of points under the coordinate tangent a point addition operation forms a group of order Q, where Q is typically chosen as a large prime or must be chosen as a large prime um, for security, with the point at infinity serving as the identity element for the group law. For efficiency, points are represented not in affine coordinates during intermediate operations, but in projective coordinates to save computation of expensive field inversions. And I can give some arithmetic intuition behind that by looking at the group law. So point addition on elliptic curve uh, works by tracing a line across the points being added and reflecting the point intersect, um, consisting of the intersection between the line and the curve across the X axis. This line becomes a tangent when the point is being doubled. So um, computing the slope of this line requires a division, which of course implies the computation of a field inversion that's expensive. So projective coordinates try to delay uh, the computation of this inversion until the very end by storing the denominator of the slope on the z-coordinate um, of the some intermediate point. All elliptic curve crypto systems rely on the scalar multiplication operation, both for performance and security. Scalar multiplication amounts to adding a point to itself a certain number of times, typically a secret number of times, and this is a signature Generation is not different. It takes a signing key, a message, uh, curve parameters, and a hash function as inputs, and it outputs a valid signature composed of two elements. It starts by sampling the known scale, a model of the group order following the uniform distribution, and then it multiplies the generator uh, by these nodes. The X coordinate of the resulting point is used in the remaining of the computation to uh, obtain the signature over the input message. Performance reasons we want this scalar multiplication operation to be as fast as possible, but security concerns um, also determine that um, 
the operation should be implemented in a way that's protected against sidechain leakage. In particular, if we worry about timing attacks, uh, this operation must be implemented in constant time. And this is extremely challenging in modern CPUs because they have user land instructions like Cflush that can reveal secrets across different processes uh, through cache behavior. For example, when two programs share a library in memory, a flush and reload attack is possible. In a flush and reload attack, an attacker process uh, probes a set of targeted addresses to find out if a different victim process is accessing them or has accessed them in a certain amount of time. Um, the flush phase of the attack is actually flushing a set of addresses from the cache. The reload amounts to reloading those addresses back to the cache and measuring the amount of time it takes for that operation to finish, which tells the attacker if this was a cache hit or a cache miss. In, if a certain address uh, was read, uh, meanwhile, this means that the reload phase will be shorter and a cache hit was um, actually observed. The time it takes between the flush and reload parts of the attack is called the slot, and this will be relevant later on. This is not a completely deterministic attack. There could be cases in which the memory access performed by the victim's process overlaps with the reload phase and creates confusion by, uh, for the attacker to distinguish between um, if the address was read or not. So that's why uh, we don't have 100% precision side channel uh, attack in our work. When you implement scalar multiplication in a way that's protected against these attacks, you usually resort to the Montgomery ladder, here defined over the Weierstrass model of elliptic arithmetic. This algorithm takes an input point P typically stored in affine coordinates and the binary representation of the exponent and initializes two accumulators R0 and R1, such that R1 is two times P. Then it scans the bits of the exponent from left to right um, and compute the same number of group operations per iteration. What changes per iteration is uh, the inputs of the group operations and the outputs. And uh, this depends on the key bits. If you try to implement this algorithm in constant time, there are several things to be taken care of. For example, the number of iterations must be fixed. Otherwise, the magnitude of K would be revealed. The accumulators must be read and written in the same order independently of the key bits. And the group law, of course, must be implemented in constant time as well. And let's see how this can be done uh, in typical implementations. To make the number of iterations constant, it's usual to add one or two multiples of the group order to the scalar to obtain a related scalar k prime. And it's interesting that if the group order is just below a power of two, this means that k prime preserves in its second most significant bit, the most significant bit of the original k. This will be relevant later on. Um, now k prime has a fixed length, so the main loop runs for a fixed number of iterations. The branches in the previous slide can be actually removed by uh, performing a conditional swap between the accumulators R0 and R1 that depends on the key bit, which means that the group law will always be evaluated over the same accumulators in the same order. So what remains is a careful implementation of the group law such that uh, no correlation with the key bits will leak through any side channels. And this is exactly the point where our attack becomes relevant. For example, if um, the implementation leaks the fact that R1 is being stored in affine coordinates. This means that the points were actually swapped for this iteration, which reveals the key bit. This observation also applies to point addition. It's if it's possible to uh, discover if R1 here is represented in projective or affine coordinates, this also tells if the points were swapped or not, which reveals the key bit. So ladder leak is an attack against the first iteration of the loop when the points are still stored in different coordinate uh, systems, and it exploits these tiny differences or timing differences uh, between the two operations in projective or uh, affine coordinates. After the first iteration of the main loop, the two accumulators are stored in projective coordinates. So uh, the performance or the, the behavior should look uniform from that point on. The, it's critical here that if the attacker is able to distinguish between these two situations, even for the first, just the first iteration of the loop, the attacker can split a set of uh, observed signatures into uh, two different types 
uh, which are biased by the uh, most significant bit of the known scale. That's how the hidden number problem uh, is used to recover the signing key. In our attacks, we targeted Broadwell CPUs with Turbo Boost disabled for reducing the noise in the measurements to, to have a slightly more um, stable uh, attack. The OpenSSL library was built using the default configuration with debugging symbols turned on to, to make the attack slightly more convenient. And binaries were executed in just user land without requiring any privileges. In terms of tooling, we used the FR trace binary from the uh, Mastic Section Analysis Toolkit, and we configured the program to use a slot of 5,000 cycles, which uh, show it to be easy to, to measure against in our target platforms. We also employed the performance degradation feature of the um, attack tool by having the idle cores evict code from the cache all the time to penalize performance and make computation run slower. Now let's examine how we mounted these attacks against implementations of both prime and binary curves. In the case of prime curves, we, the attacker can detect if R1 is stored in affine coordinates inside the point doubling operation. So our attack works by probing two different addresses and measuring the time it takes to hit the first address and the second address. And from the timing difference between these two, the attacker is able to figure out what type of computation happened in between. In the implementation of point doubling, if the Z coordinate is one, there is a branch in OpenSSL to actually copy um, an input to the result. It's much faster than actually performing a, a complete field multiplication operation. But it's still um, an operation that takes just a, a couple of hundred cycles, which would not be observable in the time of the full scalar multiplication. So with performance degradation, we penalize calls to the function B and copy here quite a lot. And we amplify the difference to uh, 15,000 cycles, which allows the flush and reload attack to detect if this function is called with more than 90% uh, precision. And we can see this behavior in the traces. So here the y-axis has the access timing cycles for reading um, some, some addresses in the cache memory. And the sample number is the number of that specific sample read as, as scalar multiplication proceeds. Any memory access that's faster than the red line counts as a cache hit uh, because it's, of course, uh, faster than a generic memory address, uh, memory access. So in the bottom trace, we can see that uh, there is a first cache hit here when BN copy is called in the first time for the first point doubling in the letter when R1 is initialized. And then we see another um, set of cache hits here that amount to the point doubling the first iteration of the loop. If the BN copy function is called, it takes a bit longer, uh, uh, around three slots for the operation to finish, which makes it visible uh, here. And of course, the same behavior is not present when uh, the most significant bit is one, which allows the attacker to distinguish the two different situations by just uh, observing what happens um, in the first iteration of the loop. A similar attack was mounted against uh, binary curve implementations. In this case, the attacker finds out if R1 was uh, stored in projective coordinates during point addition. In the formula for point addition, the first field multiplication multiplies the X coordinate of R0 by the Z coordinate of R1. So of course, if uh, the Z coordinate of R1 is non-trivial, this uh, field multiplication will give a non-trivial double precision results that needs to be modular reduced. By using performance degradation, we penalize calls to the modular reduction code to make this field multiplication take much longer than necessary. And we managed to apply, amplify the difference between 200,000 cycles, which allowed us again to detect if the Z coordinate of R1 is one with uh, over than 99% precision. By looking at the traces, uh, we see similar pattern. Um, on the bottom trace, you can see that there is there are two uh, consecutive cache hits when modular reduction is called, and they are around 20 slots apart, which tells that the difference in execution time between these two points in, in time were, was close to 100,000 cycles. And the same pattern is not present um, when the most significant bit 
has a different value um, and the modeling reduction code actually finishes uh, much faster because the result being reduced is trivial. There are at least three possible fixes for these vulnerabilities. The first one, and perhaps most natural, is to randomize the Z coordinates at the beginning of the scalar multiplication for the two accumulators in a way that all points, intermediate values are stored in projective coordinates. So no special cases arise. Another possibility is to implement the crew plow in constant time using, for example, complete addition formulas without branches, or to implement the Montgomery ladder over cozy arithmetic to not handle Z coordinates directly. We disclosed the vulnerabilities to OpenSSL in December last year when the versions we target were still uh, maintained and the vulnerabilities were fixed in April this year using the first countermeasure as the solution. The main takeaways of this part of the talk is securely implementing brittle cryptographic algorithms is still very hard and we should not underestimate uh, timing leakage, even if it looks tiny at first or not easy to exploit. For the audience, I can recommend upgrading OpenSSL to uh, the recent releases as soon as possible because the development team has done a wonderful job at improving the security and quality of the code base across time. So we should all benefit from that. From this point on, Akira continues with the part two of the presentation. Thanks for your attention so far. Hello everyone, my name is Akira, I'm from Aarhus University in Denmark. So in this part, I'm going to explain how to exploit the randomness bias or leakage that we obtained during the cyber channel attack against the ECDS and nonce. So here's the overview. So in the second part, uh, we'd like to recover the ECDS secret key by solving the so-called so hidden number problem, which was originally uh, stated by Bonnet and Ben Carson. And our approach follows the Fourier analysis space attack, uh, originally devised by Blachenbacher. And here, uh, our main contributions can be uh, summarized as follows. First, we established a unified time-space data trade-off formula to solve the hidden number problem. And then, we gave a generalized analysis that holds even in the presence of erroneous leakage information which is crucial when mounting the cyber channel attack in practice. Also, uh, the techniques uh, devised in this part, uh, in principle, apply to other sources, sources of bias or leakage, uh, independent of the ladder leak vulnerability. And as a result, uh, we uh, draw an interesting connection uh, between the hidden number problem and the generalized birth state problem, which often appears in the context of uh, symmetric key uh, cryptology. So first, let's define the problem we tackle. So we are interested in uh, solving the hidden number problem with most sim significant bit uh, leakage. So here, H and Z are, are public information which can be computed from the ECDSA signature and the sample H and the nonce K uh, follows the uniform distribution uh, over ZQ and then uh, satisfy this equation. And here, the hidden number problem asks to find the secret key given the pairs HD and the most significant bit information of K. However, uh, as we observed during the side channel attack phase, the most significant bit information uh, doesn't come with uh, probability one. So that's why uh, we have to slightly generalize the, the hidden number problem. Uh, by incorporating the erroneous, most significant bit leakage information. And this is exactly uh, what we call uh, less than uh, one bit nonce leakage. So in this setting, the hidden number problem with error rate epsilon, uh, which is between zero and one half, uh, asks to find the, the secret key given HC and the most significant bit information of K with probability one minus epsilon. And this error rate models attacker's misdetection during the cyber channel acquisition phase. Uh, if epsilon is zero, then this is same as the original hidden number problem. If epsilon is a one half, then essentially the attacker doesn't know anything about the uh, non-speed. So this is the problem we'd like to uh, solve. So 
how do we attack the hidden number problem? There are basically two approaches. The first one is uh, more famous, uh, which is called the lattice attack. So lattice attack usually works very efficiently, uh, even with a fewer uh, number of signatures. However, uh, lattice attack uh, only works uh, if you have a, a relatively uh, large uh, bias or leakage information about nodes. And in particular, if you only have one bit uh, information about the nodes, it is known that lattice attack uh, doesn't give you uh, the correct uh, solution of the hidden number problem. So here, uh, the Fourier analysis based attack uh, comes into play. So the nice uh, feature of the Fourier analysis based attack is that uh, it can attack less bias or um, less leakage information. However, uh, usually uh, this approach requires much more uh, signatures as input. So um, in this context, uh, we set the new attack records for the hidden number problem. So here's the comparison with the previous attack records uh, of the uh, hidden number problem. The green ones are based on Fourier analysis, while uh, purple ones are based on lattices. And we basically solve these four cases. For a 160-bit HMP with one-bit leak, uh, compared to prior uh, records, we required fewer input signatures uh, to attack. And on the other hand, uh, to the best of our knowledge, uh, there has been no uh, attack records uh, for the 192-bit HMP with uh, one-bit leakage. So um, we set some uh, new <coughs> attack records in, uh, in these uh, attack parameters. Okay, so before describing our technique, uh, let me uh, briefly go over the fundamentals of the Fourier analysis based attack. So what is the Fourier analysis based attack? So this was originally proposed by Brian Bacher already uh, 20 years ago. And in the last decade, uh, this was uh, revisited by uh, the model et al. And also uh, uh, two other works, uh, including some of us uh, as authors. And the great feature of the uh, Fourier analysis based attack is that it can exploit arbitrary uh, small bias or leakage of randomness uh, to solve HMP. And uh, another great feature is that it can handle the erroneous input uh, out of the box, so to speak. However, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the large uh, data complexity is the major bottleneck of this approach. In particular, uh, for instance, uh, if you uh, attack a 160-bit uh, HMP, the prior attack required uh, billions of signatures uh, to attack one bit leakage. So of course, the natural question is, uh, can we reduce the data complexity? Uh, I'm going to answer this question uh, later. Uh, but first, uh, let's um, see how Blahenbacher's attack work. So here's a high-level overview. So the step one is to quantify the modular bias of randomness k. And we first define the bias function such that it outputs something close to zero if the noise is uniform in ZQ, while it should output uh, something close to one if k is somewhat biased in ZQ. Then, using this bias function, we like to find a candidate secret key, which leads to the peak of this bias function. And then there's an important uh, optimization step, which is called a collision search of integers h, where h is a part of the signature. And this optimization step is very important uh, to detect the bias peak uh, correctly and efficiently. Okay, so that's the overview. So first, what is the bias function? So the bias function can be essentially uh, defined uh, in the form of discrete Fourier transform. So in order to uh, interpret uh, this definition, uh, it is useful to imagine the, the complex plane and the unit circle on it. Uh, for instance, if the nonce k is uniformly distributed in ZQ, then uh, we can imagine that uh, each uh, vector uh, is directed to uh, different directions. 
So of course, if you take the sum of those vectors and normalize them, then uh, we can expect that the resulting uh, norm of the summed vector is small. On the other hand, uh, what if uh, the, the nonce bit is biased? For instance, if the top bit of the nonce uh, is fixed to zero, then uh, we can actually see that the, the each corresponding vector is concentrated uh, in the, the upper half of the unit circle. Then in that case, uh, if you take the sum of those vectors, then the resulting norm uh, is expected to be uh, much larger uh, than the, the other case. So this is the intuitive way to interpret the, the, the bias function. So we can actually uh, concretely calculate the, the output of the bias function. So here's the uh, in, uh, useful lemma. If the randomness case top bits are fixed, for instance, uh, if the nonce bits, uh, two nonce bits are fixed to zero one, like this, then uh, its modular bias uh, can be estimated uh, by this form. So using this form, uh, we can indeed uh, calculate the, the value of the bias function. And as you can see here, uh, if the, the biased bits uh, are larger, then uh, the resulting bias uh, gets closer to one. So uh, this is the, the concrete behavior of the bias function, but in order to uh, model the erroneous input, we have to uh, <coughs> give more uh, analysis uh, of the bias function. So this is uh, you know, what is given in the paper. So in our case, we are particularly interested in the one bit uh, bias case. So here, this lemma says uh, that if the, uh, the non speed, uh, the, if the nones uh, is uh, one bit biased, with probability 1 minus epsilon, then uh, its bias value uh, can be uh, described by a bias for, sorry, the bias function uh, value for full 1-bit bias multiplied by 1 minus 2 epsilon. So this is how uh, the bias value decays uh, depending on the, the noise to epsilon, uh, sorry, epsilon. For instance, if the most significant bit of the k is fixed to zero, uh, except 1% fraction, in other words, uh, if epsilon is equal to 0 0.01, then uh, the bias function uh, can be calculated uh, like this. So uh, we are going to use uh, this uh, bias function under the uh, Reynolds input uh, in the concrete analysis. So now, using this bias function, we'd like to detect the bias peak is a naive approach. So first, we are given m samples of signatures satisfying this uh, module equation. Then we pick a secret key candidate and compute the corresponding uh, randomness. Then using uh, the set of corresponding uh, randomness candidates, we compute the bias function uh, with a suitable FFT algorithm. Then finally, uh, if the guess is correct, we can uh, detect a significant non-zero sample bias. Uh, if the case is, case is incorrect, then actually we can show that the, the noise floor uh, of the bias function uh, is approximately 1 over uh, square root m, uh, which should be small if the m is sufficiently large. But of course, this naive approach is inefficient because the peak only appears if you hit uh, the exact solution. And uh, so this approach is, of course, uh, clearly infeasible uh, if the modulus Q is large. In the concrete case, the Q is at least 160 uh, bit, so we cannot really compute because the FFT uh, algorithm takes uh, order Q space and uh, order Q times log Q time. So how do we circumvent this issue? So Bleichenbacher gave a very clever observation uh, to uh, reduce the, the, the complexity of the FFT algorithm. So this is the, uh, the, the most important step called collision search phase. Uh, so this is useful 
to broaden the peak of the bias. So black and white observation is as follows. By reducing the range of the uh, input samples H to Z and L, where uh, this L should be much uh, smaller than the original modulus Q, and by taking the linear combinations of H uh, samples, peak width actually broadens uh, to approximately Q over L. Uh, however, as a negative side effect, the peak height actually decays. But anyway, um, thanks to the, the broadened peak, uh, it is sufficient to check on the L candidates uh, of the secret key. And uh, now the, the complexity of FFT uh, is much smaller uh, if you uh, choose the L appropriately. And by checking the L candidates, at least you can expect that um, you hit somewhere in this mountain. So this is the um, overall idea of the collision search phase. So more formally, collision search problem in Blyhenbach's framework can be uh, stated as follows. So again, we are given M signature pairs and we set the memory budget uh, for FFT. Then we'd like to find sufficiently many linear combinations such that the resulting linear combination is smaller than the memory budget for FFT. Also, we have to make sure that the, the coefficients of the linear combination uh, is sparse. And this is important because uh, otherwise uh, the bias peak uh, decays a lot. So uh, we have to uh, make sure that the decayed bias peak uh, is at least larger than the noise floor. So we have to take uh, find some uh, good balance between the smallness of the linear combination and the sparsity of the coefficients. So actually, uh, this problem looks really like a subset sum uh, problem. However, uh, there's a subtle difference. In our context, uh, we need many linear combinations instead of a single exact solutions. So we have to uh, use uh, some appropriate algorithm to solve this collision search problem. So in our work, uh, we apply Kelly's sum algorithm, uh, which was uh, usually uh, applied uh, to attack the generalized birthday program. So here's the very uh, high level overview of the Kelly sum algorithm for generalized birthday program. So in uh, Kelly sum algorithm, uh, you are usually uh, given uh, multiple lists of the samples. And then uh, if the, the number of the list is four, for instance, for you first take the linear combinations of two between uh, uh, two lists, then you find the some linear combinations such that uh, their top bit uh, corresponds to a certain value. Then uh, you construct uh, the, the intermediate uh, list. Then by, uh, by uh, taking the difference between uh, those two lists, uh, we find uh, the some small uh, linear combinations for. And thanks to the, the intermediate collision uh, found in the prior phase, we can expect that uh, the resulting uh, difference uh, is uh, somewhat small. So that's the, the very high level idea of this algorithm. And in particular, we apply Halgrave Graham Joe's uh, Kelly sum algorithm. There are many variants, but uh, this uh, version of the Kelly sum algorithm has uh, two good, great advantages. First, uh, it is configurable, it has configurable time memory trade offs. Also, uh, it is highly parallelizable, and this is important when we uh, implement a tapping practice. So the question of um, question we asked earlier uh, can be elaborated as follows, because uh, now it is not sufficient to consider time memory trade-offs. We have to uh, introduce the third uh, parameter uh, that is input data complexity. So uh, our question is as follows. For given most significant bit information from hidden number problem and attacker's budget for computational resources, what, be, what would be the optimal balance between the time, memory, and input data complexities? We answer this question in the paper. So um, again, here's the uh, high-level uh, description of the unifying time memory data trade-off that we derived based on the, the prior work. So I'm not going to uh, explain how we derive this formula, but uh, intuitively, 
to interpret uh, this formula, um, uh, you can uh, see each <coughs> uh, the behavior of the each uh, variable as follows. So first, the goal of our uh, problem is to find many uh, solutions, uh, which is mi plus 1. And intuitively, uh, if you spend more time or if you have more memory space, then we can expect that uh, we find many uh, output samples. On the other hand, uh, if, if you have to find many uh, bit collisions, then probably uh, we get uh, less uh, number of samples. So um, that's the, the intuition. And then together with a uh, trade-off formula, uh, and uh, the, the constraints that I showed uh, earlier uh, from Blachenbach, we can indeed estimate the optimal time memory data complexity balance. So here's the result. So we uh, calculated uh, the trade-off curves uh, for each uh, HNP instances. So for instance, in order to attack uh, 60, uh, 163 R1 curve, um, if you can spend uh, around 2 to the 55, Time, then uh, you only need around uh, uh, less than a million of signatures. And if you can spend uh, much less time, then you need more data as input. And the same analysis applies to the other missed curves. Also, uh, even though I focused on a one bit bias case, our paper has various uh, trade of graphs and the improved uh, complexity estimates for two or three bits. Uh, bias. So, uh, to show the, uh, the, the usefulness of our analysis, we implemented the entire attack. So here's the experimental results on the through key uh, recovery um, for the OpenSSL. So first, uh, when we attack P182, uh, our uh, highly optimized parallel implementation helps a lot. So uh, we executed our attack uh, using AWS uh, EC2 instances, and we used uh, 24 instances here. And in the end, uh, we were able to recover uh, the many uh, most significant bits of the secret key. And the attack was su successful uh, for both cases uh, where the, the, there was no error in the input samples, and there was 1% error in the input samples. And on the other hand, the attack against 60163R1 uh, was very modest in terms of uh, computational complexity. And we can actually infer that uh, the attack against uh, this case is even feasible uh, with an everyday uh, laptop. And also the input data complexity was uh, uh, much more modest compared to the prior work. Uh, actually, uh, we improved the data complexity by a factor of uh, 1,000. And uh, of course, the attack uh, works against both uh, the samples with errors and without errors. And once you recover the, the top bits of the secret key, uh, recovering the remaining bits of the uh, secret key is much cheaper in Blahim as a framework. And uh, based on this empirical result, we can infer that the attacks against P20, P224 with 1-bit bias or uh, P256 with 2-bit bias are also tractable. Okay, so to conclude, uh, in this work, we show that even less than 1-bit of noise leakage becomes a practical concern. And then we draw the interesting connection between uh, two different cryptographic problems. Uh, which appear in a different context, usually. And after the analysis, we got multiple open questions. Uh, of course, um, the first one is uh, the, the list sum algorithm, because we only analyzed uh, particular uh, instances of the k list sum algorithms. Uh, we are interested in exploring uh, more trade-offs uh, obtained by other uh, variants of the list sum algorithms. Also, uh, in the FFT computation part, uh, we basically used the, 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 the existing library as black box. So 
Of course, there's probably some improve, uh, room for improvement uh, for the FFT computation phase. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this analysis uh, is not restricted to uh, ladder leak vulnerability. So in the future, if there are uh, more uh, sources of small leakage uh, in the ECGS and noise, uh, in particular, uh, according to an uh, analysis, uh, if two or three bits of leakage of bias uh, available, then uh, the attack, tech, attack is much more efficient and our analysis uh, in principle applies. Also, uh, we are interested in analyzing the behavior of bias function for more general patterns of noisy leakage. Okay, so that's it from me. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'll be happy to answer. And if you are interested in, in more details, uh, you can find our paper in this address.